Realm presents Orphan Black, The Next Chapter, starring Tatiana Maslany. Episode 7. 48 hours after exposure. Who is the person behind this face? Sally Winter's measured voice was groomed by years of climbing the corporate news ladder. Her smooth narration was a stark contrast to the chaotic, shaky footage on screen, which showcased Sarah Manning and Delphine Cormier struggling to keep hold of a drugged clone, CIA operative Vivi Valdez. The footage paused for a more pensive voiceover. And who is behind this face? The footage jumped to life again. Vivi's terrified eyes shot down the barrel of the camera that had invaded Delphine's living room. Help me! Vivi shouted. I'm in here. Help me. They're crazy. They think I'm a clone. Help me. Then reporters, bloggers, drones, and paparazzi poured into the house. Two camera operators manhandled Sarah, freeing Vivi, who in return punched one of them in the jaw before escaping. What about this face? The show cut to a clone with green spikes of hair. The distressed woman tried to shield her face as she scampered down a cobblestone street. Leave me alone, you wank stains. She growled in a Scottish accent before thwacking away the camera and plunging the screen into blackness. Sally Winters, the immaculately quaffed anchor of news magazine Hindsight, faded into view. She was relaxed yet poised in a leather armchair. The woman you just saw is Mackenzie McCarthy of Glasgow, Scotland. She injured the camera operator who shot that footage and has not been seen since. The woman we first showed you is Sarah Manning of Toronto, Canada, and the clearly confused woman with Miss Manning remains unidentified. An anonymous press package, delivered to broadcasters and newspapers everywhere, claims these women, and many others, are clones. Are these remarkably identical women truly genetic copies created in a lab? If so, what does this mean in the context of the world and science? Some would say this is an astonishing scientific achievement, something to be studied and embraced. Others disagree. Or is this all merely an extraordinary coincidence? Hindsight set out to uncover the truth by setting up a clone hotline, which has received over three dozen reports of other identical women from around the globe. A Lita clone in a pantsuit being attacked by camera flashes appeared on screen. Reporters hollered, Zarin, Zarin, as she made her way out of a large glass and marble building. She begged, squeezing through the throng. Barked a voice off camera as clear liquid splashed into the clone's face. Shrieking, the woman clutched her eyes. Someone in a balaclava rushed in, pouring bleach over the clone's head, nearly emptying the bottle before police intervened. Zarin Silva of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, suffered permanent damage to her eyes from that attack, Winter's voice narrated. Her attacker, who was caught and charged, is part of 46 Pure, an international group of genetic purists who strongly oppose the modification of any organism. While the group claims they do not condone the use of violence, it also does not penalize its extremist members for any of their actions. A bulldog of a man popped up on screen. A chiron below him stated he was Bill Williams, executive director of 46 Pure, Virginia chapter. You have to understand, people don't feel safe, Williams stated. If there are human clones running around in secret, what else have scientists done to our food, our water? And are these human photocopies breeding with natural, normal people? If their altered genes get into our gene pool... Who knows what will happen? Birth defects, new diseases, there's just no way to know. That's the problem when you tamper with nature. 46 Pure isn't here to use force. We're here to be a voice for people who are concerned about this. And we won't rest until the government and authorities have heard us and taken the appropriate steps toward making sure these women aren't a threat. A woman in a lab coat with a stern, equally intimidating stare appeared on screen. This was Ava Goddard a renowned geneticist and author. If human cloning was successful back in the 1980s, we need to embrace these women, she said. This sort of monumental breakthrough is unfathomable, 
The scientific community should have access to any data connected to these people, including details on the cloning process. It should be public knowledge. The show cut back to Sally Winters in her armchair. The public is already polarized over the idea of human clones. But how do these identical-looking women feel? Hindsight's investigation of this spellbinding story took us to a nail salon in Toronto, Canada, and what we found was astonishing. Giving the camera bedroom eyes, Crystal Goderich said, Can I just introduce myself? I always start like that on my vlog, KB. I'm Crystal Goderich, big cosmetics activist and lawyer. Well, soon to be lawyer. I take my bar this year, but trust me, I'm going to ace it. Miss Goderich, Sally Winters started. Please, Crystal, the clone interjected. I've been watching you, like, since I was a kid. Crystal, what do you make of the claim that you and dozens of other women are clones? It's loopy. Right. If you aren't clones, then are you quadruplets? Quintuplets? Sextuplets? Sextuplets? What do you mean? Crystal shot, her eyes narrowing with suspicion. I mean, there are many others that look just like you. Winters rephrased, cocking her head to the side as though examining a baffling work of art. There's only one of me, Miss Winters, Crystal boasted. Our research shows there are a number of women that bear a striking resemblance to you. So far, we've identified over three dozen. Winters explained, holding up a professionally shot photo of Alita clones surrounded by a collection of designer handbags. This is Tamiko Nakamura, an entrepreneur in the Japanese fashion industry. Winters held up another shot of a clone with a children's basketball team. This is Joanna Moore, a gym teacher in Winnipeg, Canada. Winters pulled out a picture of a heavily tattooed clone wearing oversized glasses. And Anne Gentleman is a barista in Portland, Oregon. Finally, Winters revealed a mugshot of petulant 20-something Sarah Manning. And this is Sarah Manning, whom you claim to know. Oh, she's nuttier than a fruitcake, Crystal said, rolling her eyes. She believes this clone stuff, but, I mean, isn't that a mugshot? Miss Winters, are you going to trust some psycho criminal or me, a law student? Winters in her armchair faded back into view. Not only did Miss Goderich deny she was a clone, She also wouldn't elaborate on her relationship to Sarah Manning, who we could not locate. However, further research into Miss Manning's background revealed charges of assault and petty theft. And according to someone who knows another one of these purported clones, there may be a pattern of criminality amongst them. Alison Hendricks was my neighbor. Pert, Charity Sims said, fiddling with her pearl necklace. Her daughter was best friends with my daughter. We threw potlucks together. Allison was the poster girl for our neighborhood. Literally. A pink, flower-covered poster reading Elect Allison Hendricks, School Trustee, appeared on screen. She ran for school trustee and won. She was a major part of our community for years. Charity leaned in, ready to dish. But I always had a bad feeling about her. And it turned out beneath that perfect facade, Allison was an alcoholic and drug addict. She cheated on her husband with her best friend's husband, put her kids through hell. There were even rumors she was dealing pills. The footage paused, freezing Charity's face in a sneer. A remote control shattered on the wall next to a flat-screen TV glowing with Charity's contorted face. Sarah, Delphine snapped from the couch where they had been watching. My sodding mugshot on international television, Sarah bellowed, looking around for something else to break in Delphine's living room. What about Allie? Charity Sims dragged her face down through the mud, Donnie said from a tablet on the coffee table. Their emergency clone call was clearly heating up. Alison will see this and the blood will be spilled. Helena replied calmly from a video chat on a cell phone next to Donnie. She was in a car somewhere. We don't have room for another body in the garage! Donnie shrieked. 
Lucky they don't have anything on you, Helena, Sarah snarled. You don't have to worry about the world knowing you're a clone and a criminal. You can probably just stay in the Yukon and have a semi-normal life with your boys. I'm not in Yukon anymore, muttered Helena. What do you mean? Where are you? Delphine asked. On the road. I want to be with my sisters in this dark time, Helena said. The grim tone of her words unnerved Delphine. Yes, Sarah had been charged with assault, but Helena had done many unspeakable, violent things. And yes, an outsider might conclude that many Litas had criminal tendencies, but these women had been forced to cross lines. They had been driven to the brink by Dyad, Neolution, the Prolethean cult, and countless others who tried to manipulate or destroy them. This press release could rehash that period of living hell, and Delphine wasn't sure Clone Club would survive another round. Fuck it. I'm going to find Kira before the tabloids do, Sarah said, snatching up her leather jacket. They'll find out about Lin 28A. That fountain of youth shit will start up again. People will want to get their hands on her. I can't let that happen. Sarah marched toward the door and opened it. Sarah, don't, Delphine urged. But the flashbulbs were already firing off outside, sending bursts of seizure-inducing light into the house. Delphine raced over and slammed the door against the horde of camera operators and reporters camped out on her lawn. You can't go out there, Delphine insisted. Just hide in the house like a mouse, Helena chided from the phone. Like bloody hell I will, Sarah said, heading for the stairs. Delphine grabbed her jacket. Where are you going? Sarah twisted out of her grasp. Don't worry, I'll roof hop to the end of the block and climb down, they won't see me. You're not the only one, Sarah. We're screwed too, Delphine spat. Our faces, my career, my marriage is in that expose. Cosima was kidnapped from police custody. Everyone will find out she was charged with terrorism. Then what? Death threats? Bigots will smash our windows? Even if my lawyers do find her, we're trapped. She teared up. This isn't square one. This is worse. But like the last time, we have to stick together. We can't get reckless. We're on display. The government is upping biometric security, and that Clone hotline is just a witch hunt. Staying away from Kira is the best thing you could do for her. Your face could get you both strapped to a table in a lab, or thrown down a well by 46 Pure. Sarah couldn't deny what Delphine was saying. She wanted to protect her daughter, but she was an even bigger liability now. Kira was better off without her. Who the F did this to us? Donnie blurted from the coffee table. Bitch, Rachel. Helena offered. I don't know. Delphine was unconvinced. Why would Rachel put herself in a fishbowl again after living in Dyad most of her life? Maybe that new Lita, the redhead at the airport, did this, Donnie offered. Why? Art said she is CIA. Public face is death sentence for spy. Helena reasoned. Nathaniel Sturgis, the geneticist that interviewed Cosima, Delphine thought aloud. He knew about the Leda program, about Dyad. Whoever told him could have told the press. Sarah was spiraling deeper and deeper, a ball of questions and emotions caught in her throat. It had taken five years of therapy and antidepressants just to fade the Neolution scars. She could finally sleep through the night without flashbacks and had been holding down a job as a forklift operator. She and Cal weren't even fighting anymore. But now the new leaf she had turned seemed to be withering. I need a beer, she croaked. Grabbing a microbrew and a handful of Cosima's THC truffles, Sarah locked herself in the bathroom. She scarfed down the chocolates. As she waited for the THC to release some of the tension laced throughout her body, she typed a text to Kira. Watch news. We are under attack. It's not a secret anymore. We don't know who did it or what will happen next. Tell me you're safe and I'll leave you alone, please. Sarah waited. No response. Not even three little dots contemplating one. This was all her fault. She never called Mrs. S when she ran away. Maybe Kira was mimicking all her behavioral shit. 
Maybe it was in her genes. Maybe the stability she failed to provide during her daughter's childhood was catching up. A severely delayed pang of regret hit Sarah, and an even bigger lump formed in her throat. If she had been a different person, none of this would be happening. She wouldn't be such a risk to her daughter. She knew Kira was safer on her own now, and that she had to let go. She was just hoping the pot truffles would loosen her grip. Kasima Niehaus's photograph shone on a screen playing the Sally Winters expose. Ironically, she has a doctorate in human genetics. Winter's voice drifted out of a tinny speaker. And her wife, Delphine Cormier, a tenured professor at the University of Toronto, is an expert in the field of genetic ethics. The video paused. And she's our bloody consultant. A white-haired man spat across the boardroom at Eloise Thibault. You picked someone whose wife is a clone and a suspect in a terrorist bombing. Real winner, Thibault. As I remember it, Drummond, we all voted for Cormier. Eloise snarled, exhausted. This was Drummond's 20th comment during BioThreat's hindsight screening. The thought of nailing him right between the eyes with a semi-automatic was the only thing carrying her through their emergency meeting. You pushed her, influenced everyone, Drummond rebutted. Christ, Drummond, Cormier was the most qualified, snapped Greg Kurtzman. And now she's the biggest conflict of interest. She's married to a terrorist. Drummond barked. And she was privy to our agenda, pointed out a balding Ministry of Defense rep. As a consultant, she had to be, otherwise there would have been nothing to consult on, Greg sneered. You're bold for someone so wet between the ears, Drummond said. Behind, you moron, Greg snickered. Behind the ears. In my day, insubordinate shits like you weren't allowed to sit at this table. Guess this isn't your day. Looking like he was about to have a stroke, Drummond shot out of his chair. He was dying to scamper across the table and strangle Greg. If he had been 25 years younger, maybe that would have been an option. Enough, Eloise boomed. Everyone go get the goddamn scotch and come back with your head screwed on straight. If you can't manage that, don't come back. Slowly, the men rose from their chairs and shuffled out the door, many muttering under their breath. Despite the fact that she was lieutenant general, they clearly didn't like to take orders from her. But Eloise didn't give a shit. She had bigger things to contend with. Greg, stay, she commanded. He lingered behind, the older men rolling their eyes at his obedience. Eloise waited until they were alone. Thank you, she said, a smile warming her previously cold face. My pleasure, Greg smirked. It's fun ruffling those old white feathers. That clone expose was a blessing in disguise, Eloise thought aloud. It's got all those buffoons looking the other way at Cormier and her terrorist wife, and the media coverage will likely kill this task force, Dieu merci. Then I won't have to pander to these old clowns. I can just focus on getting my projects through the pipeline. Speaking of which, where are we with everything? We should have the green light in 24 hours. Good she said, taking out a cigarette. Putting old men out to pasture, ushering in female clones. It's poetic, Greg mused, getting misty. Eloise frowned. She hated it when he tried to be artsy. It made her worry un petit peu. Right, she said in as sober a tone as she could. Regular reports when you're on the ground. Full details, no flowery shit. Of course, Greg said, taking out his lighter and sparking it to life for her. Pulling away her unlit cigarette, Eloise glared. She also hated it when Greg tried to be a gentleman. It was a put-on. You know we don't smoke in here, she said as she turned away. Reports every 30 minutes. Eloise shot over her shoulder as she headed for the nearest bar. Standing in the dark, Alexander Davis shot back a glass of bourbon and stared at the overnight bag sitting in his dining room. Rhonda would leave him for sure this time. She lived in constant suspicion. And why wouldn't she? His work was detrimentally clandestine, sending him on trips he couldn't explain. And after he was made the director of the Scientific Vanguard Department and put in charge of the Boston Project, everything only got more clandestine. 
In the past, he had divulged classified information to Rhonda to save his marriage, but he couldn't tell her he was watching over human clones. That was just too big. He'd likely disappear if the CIA found out he had revealed the project. The trade-off for keeping this secret was his marriage. After numerous fights, two trial separations, and catching Rhonda having revenge sex with their favorite barista, Davis was okay with that. But it wasn't just his troubled marriage spurring him to grab a flight to Toronto. It was the images of clones burned into his brain, along with Sally Winter's voice droning on repeat. Who is the person behind this face? What about this face? Davis hated all those faces, and seeing Vivi Valdez's likeness on camera unearthed a deep anger. Vivi should have been contained under his supervision, not out in the world functioning as a CIA operative. What an idiotic oversight. Who let her slip through the cracks? Why wasn't she still part of the Boston Project? Vivi should have been in the hospital with Dana and the others, delirious with fever and covered in a rash. And he should still be monitoring the efficiency of TAG, Canada's fledgling bioweapon, which should have killed the clones. But now, none of the goddamn clones were dead or in hospital. And worst of all, Nathaniel Sturgis still owed him intel on this bioweapon, but that moron had gotten himself killed. Davis almost believed his old university chum had died just to cock block him from becoming a true American hero. Blood pressure rising, he whipped his lowball glass, shattering it on the wall. Darling, squeaked his wife, wrapping herself protectively with her robe while gazing down at him from the staircase. Rhonda, Davis muttered, unsure of what to say. Sorry, I'll sweep it up. What's going on? She asked, pacing toward him. Why are you down here, drinking in the dark? And why is your bag packed? I have a work trip. Davis lied. This trip wasn't sanctioned by the CIA. They had no idea he was going. But it was for his career. His name would be in history books for procuring a genetic bioweapon. He was going to single-handedly bump his country to the front lines of this arms race. Then Rhonda would kick herself for screwing that barista. Is there any point in me asking where you're going? She said, pursing her lips. He couldn't tell her. The TV expose had featured many clones in Toronto. As soon as he mentioned that city, she'd put two and two together. I... I keep getting cock-blocked, he said instead. This was a really poor choice of words because Rhonda immediately assumed he was talking about some woman that wouldn't accept his advances. This is the most honest you've ever been with me. Rhonda sniffed. Isn't that sad? No, I don't mean it like that. Davis said, backtracking. I mean, I want to make a goddamn difference on this project I'm overseeing, but the DDO is screwing me. He's making me monitor T-cell counts, psychological profiles, how often people get UTIs. I know there's more I can be doing for our country. It was true. The deputy director of operations, who originally spearheaded the Boston Project, shot down all of Davis's proposals for repurposing the clones. The old codger was sentimental about his girls and had relegated Davis to trivial tasks. They had access to human genetic identicals, yet all they got out of it were tests a regular physician could run. They could be learning more about cancers, degenerative diseases, turning off and on markers. Arranging for the Boston clones to be infected with a tag weapon was Davis's way of breaking free of the DDO's stranglehold. He was trying to make the most of this project. This trip, Davis started, is to help me ascend. I'm going to get something that will make me a hero. It sounded stupider out loud, and Davis regretted saying it immediately. Okay, said Rhonda Leary. Did you drink all the bourbon? Yes, but I'm serious, Rond, he insisted. We're on the brink of another Cold War, a secret one, and I might have a way to bolster our defenses, put us on par with everyone else. This trip is a national security imperative. Rhonda still wasn't sold on his story. This was probably because she, like the rest of America, wasn't aware that the Canadian government was developing a genetically-based weapon. 
their dopey friend to the north was now a threat. Rhonda scoffed. Sticking my neck out, pushing boundaries, bottles of Loch Tag, just to get details on this fucking thing, and my wife scoffs? Davis snapped, grabbing his bag. No, I won't stand for that. He was tempted to light up a smoke in their dining room just to piss her off. Loch Tag? You only drank that shitty scotch with that snob from university, said Rhonda, piecing it together. Is Nathaniel Sturgis involved in this? Shit. Davis realized. I drank too much and said too much. One quick Google and she'll see he was the director of research at the Grid Institute, where the tag weapon was developed. Some algorithm will pick up her search, flag her IP, and we'll both disappear. No. Davis fibbed poorly. I haven't seen that doofus in ages. That was total bullshit. He'd had an impromptu reunion with good old Sturgy a couple months ago, and after three bottles of Loch Tag, Davis had him agreeing to test Tag on his Boston clones because together they could become heroes. But it turned out Sturgy Boy didn't really want to be a hero. He administered a non-lethal version of the bioweapon virus to the clones without handing over any intel on it. Only when Davis whipped out a giant file on Sturgis's indiscretions did he agree to hand over TAG design documents. Then, conveniently, the grit lab and all its contents went up in a ball of fire, and Sturgis vanished. Rhonda eyed him, which made the back of his neck burn. She was going to figure out what was going on and ruin his chances at rising out of the trash heap the CIA had banished him to. He was starting to hate her almost as much as he hated that flaccid deputy director of operations. Shit. He hated that DDO. He didn't hate Rhonda that much. Rhonda worried him, and so did Valdez. She'd gone dark after the clone expose, perhaps rogue. No one knew where she was. Not even that Canadian cop he called Jay Sara, what's her name? She arrested the wrong clone for terrorism. For all he knew, Valdez was out there selling the bioweapon to the highest bidder. If that were the case, he had to find her before she cashed out. With all these clones floating around in Toronto, locating her wouldn't be easy. He'd have to step on a few clone faces to do it, which wasn't a problem. He was done with clones and on to better things. I gotta go find out if this bitch has what I need, growled Davis, heading to the door. He didn't give a shit about his choice of words this time. What about the glass, Alexander? Rhonda snapped. I'll call Estella to come clean it in the morning. He spat, stomping down the walk to catch a cab to the airport. At first, Allison Hendricks found the glow of daylight through the white plastic comforting. It wasn't pitch black and suffocating as she expected. However, the thing that got to her was the constant crinkling sound it made. It had an effect completely opposite to the ASMR videos she had watched to distract herself from the urge to drink and drug. Every little crinkle and crangle made her want to jump out of her skin. Staying clean for eight years hadn't been easy, and trying to lie still in a body bag was threatening her sobriety. Arun had told them not to move and that he'd unzip them when they were in the clear. But what if he's a liar? Allison thought to herself. We barely know the man, yet we let him zip us all up and wheel us out of the hospital to God knows where. Then, just as she was about to rip her way out, a door opened, or closed, Allison couldn't be sure, interrupting her paranoia. The zipper on her body bag split open to reveal Arun's concerned face. You okay? He asked. I was okay two hours ago. Allison huffed, sitting up. She was in an abandoned warehouse and was relieved to see Charlotte and Dana's body bags beside her. Sorry, Arun apologized. It took time to locate safe houses and medical help for the other cousins. Hey, what about me? Asked Dana, writhing in her death cocoon like a gigantic grub. Arun freed the surprisingly spry clone. She seemed to have nearly recovered from the virus. Her rash was down and she had healthy color in her cheeks. On the other hand, Charlotte had been oddly quiet for a while and emerged dripping with sweat and covered in oozing welts. 
Exhausted, the teen immediately curled up on the ground. Son of a Baptist preacher! Allison gasped, moving toward her niece. Don't touch her, warned Arun. She's contagious. Allison snapped her hands back. Shar, honey, you okay? Charlotte only moaned in response. Dana made her way to the teen's side. Stop, said Allison, waving her back. I, I've probably got immunity, Dana said, feeling Charlotte's head. She has a high fever. Mine lasted a few days, I think. Days? panicked Allison. I need to get her home now. She needs a doctor, Dana said. Allison turned on her phone, ignoring the new, younger clone. Char, sweetheart, I'm going to call Uncle Donnie, and we're going to get you to Auntie Delphine. She'll know what to do. Before she could dial, dozens of panicked texts from her husband, Sarah, and Delphine flooded her phone. They had all sent her a link to watch. It was a Sally Winters hindsight episode entitled, The Clone Question. Watching, Allison could barely contain herself for the duration of the episode. When it was over, she blurted, I'm going to punt Charity's head into a wall. Who the flip exposed us? From the factory floor, Charlotte muttered, Ooh, the flip. I can't believe you've all been in hiding your whole lives. Three dozen of you? Dana murmured, stunned. 274 of us, Allison corrected. That we know of. But most of them don't know their clones, so hiding isn't exactly the right word. Allison noticed Arun replaying the clip of the red-headed clone in Sarah's clutches. He paused it and stared at her panicked face. Arun, do you know that woman? She asked. His silence was his admission. Who is she? Allison pressed. My operative, Arun confessed hesitantly. Mother Smucker! Allison said, closing in on him. Maybe he was responsible for the bombing, for Cosima's arrest. Maybe Vivi blew up that research lab. Did they expose the Lita clones? Why did you send her after us? What are you looking for? I didn't send her after you, Arun clarified. You had nothing to do with this operation. She was sent to recover unrelated intel. The clone thing was a surprise, and I'm worried it's put Vivi on the chopping block. Can't really be covert operations when there's 274 of you roaming the planet. What did you say her name was? Dana asked. Vivi, Vivian, Arun answered, not wanting to reveal more. Vivian, that was the name of one of my cousins, said Dana. Well, your cousin stalked me to an airport. Any idea why? Allison asked. No, she was sent away when we were maybe six. Dana explained. She was a problem child, aggressive, but like a sister to me. We did everything together. She'd pretend to be me so I didn't have to eat potatoes, and I'd be her when she needed to apologize for punching one of the cousins, which happened a lot, which is probably why she was sent away. It's been so long I'd almost forgotten. Based on her reaction to the word clones in that video, I think she's forgotten too, Allison said. Vivi never mentioned any family beyond her parents, admitted Arun. Allison noticed his voice was thickening with sadness and suspected their operative handler relationship wasn't as simple as he made it seem. But that wasn't her problem. Well, this is all interesting, but it doesn't help me get Charlotte home. Everyone knows we're clones and I can't even touch her, said Allison, wringing her hands. She had been considering dousing Char in rubbing alcohol and putting her in the body bag, but that probably wouldn't go over too well at the border. I can help get her home, Dana offered. I wouldn't mind meeting more of the Litas. Really? Allison didn't mean to sound quite so skeptical, but she wondered why someone would willingly walk into a clone storm. Yes, really, Dana smiled shyly. I'm an ethnographer. And most of my work is about myself and my cousins. Although, of course, she added, the smile dropping off her face. I've had to disguise most of it as being based on twins or triplets. This left Allison speechless. She had lived most of her life unaware. And Dana was so easy breezy about it all, it sort of made her sick. 
she had worked so hard to come to terms with her cloneness. If you find Vivi... Arun hesitated, then shook himself. I can't even imagine what she's going through, and I can't contact her. I don't want the agency to know where she is. Not until this is shaken out a little more. Well, Vivi found me, Allison told him. So I'd say there's a high chance we'll see her again. If her self-discovery is anything like mine was, she'll come back with questions. Whether or not I'll answer them depends on how friendly she is this time. She's a good person, Arun assured. But Allison's look told him she wasn't buying that. She can be a little rough sometimes, but Vivi's the best operative I've ever worked with. I just want her to know about Davis, that she can't trust everyone at the agency. Please tell her I'm in D.C. keeping my ear to the ground. I will, Dana promised him. But Allison wasn't going to make any promises. She didn't trust Arun and didn't quite know what to make of Dana. The clones in the media, the mysterious illness, a shady spy handler, everything was dredging up deep-seated PTSD, and she was having trouble focusing. It felt like all her music therapy was being undone. If it weren't for Charlotte, she'd run. But she had to get her niece home safely. Though it made her head spin, Dana seemed like the only way to do this. Dousing her niece in alcohol had been a laughable plan, but Allison was starting to think that dousing herself in alcohol didn't sound half bad. Clone. Rum burned as it seeped into Vivi's ragged, superficial cuts from the broken bottle held to her neck. She imagined this replacement antiseptic running into her bloodstream, cleansing her of the word clone. No, it wasn't strong enough. So she took a giant gulp of the shitty booze she had found under the sink in her rental house, feeling the cleansing heat spread down her esophagus. Who is the person behind this face? Hindsight was on TV again. It showed her being held captive by amateurs. How embarrassing. And that word kept coming up. Clone. Vivi struggled with the remote, but the TV wouldn't turn off. She grabbed the flat screen and threw it into the coffee table. Fuck the security deposit. She needed silence. It lasted two seconds because the thought suddenly squirmed to the forefront of her mind. Maybe she wasn't who she thought she was. It had all been a lie. She wasn't actually a manic-depressive narcissist who dreamt up identical imaginary friends, as her parents had claimed. Her friends had been real. Yet she had spent her life hiding a mental illness she didn't have, just so she could become an operative. It had been her dream. Vivi had poured every ounce of energy she had into building a career at the CIA. She didn't have kids, or husband, or even hobbies, and up until now she had been fine with that. But seeing all those other women who looked just like her, living completely different lives, made her wonder if she had made all the wrong choices. Was she really happy working as an operative? After years of pretending to be other people for a living, how the hell did she even know who she really was at this point? Could she have made different choices and been happier? Could she have had dreadlocks and a swish little house downtown? Could she have had a dopey husband and two bratty kids? Could she even go back to clandestine ops now? A clone couldn't be a spy. That was ludicrous. What the hell was she going to do? She needed advice, and there was only one person who would have her back. Choking down more rum, Vivi dialed Arun's number. No one had picked up earlier, but now a familiar, cheery voice answered, Gemstone Marketing Solutions. I'm calling about the Sapphire Plan, Vivi said, following procedure. One moment, please, the voice replied. Vivi waited for what seemed like an oddly long time. Arun didn't usually take this long to pick up. It was odd. But it wouldn't be odd if they wanted to burn her. No, that couldn't be. Arun promised to warn her if it ever came to that, and he definitely would have called after seeing the clone stuff on TV. So why hadn't he? What if they burned him too? The CIA had a clone operative. They'd never want that to get out. Maybe they were wiping all traces of her already, 
including Arun. Or Arun was in on it. Nathaniel Sturgis was murdered right in front of her. Were they trying to set her up to take the fall? Hell, they could have orchestrated the bombing. Was this operation not actually about intel? Did her government want to execute a Canadian geneticist they deemed a threat and avoid political repercussions by making her a scapegoat? If that was the case, the plan fucking failed. Now they'd have to locate and kill her. Locate her. Vivi hung up, then yanked the chip and battery out of her phone. She was probably being traced. Grabbing a duffel bag, the bottle of rum, and throwing on a ball cap, Vivi raced to the subway. It was late, and the only other person on the train was more plastered than she was. Vivi didn't know where she was going. All she knew was that she had to disappear, and as she gazed at her reflection in the train's dark window, she realized that was now a very difficult thing to do. Everyone knew her face. Running wouldn't protect her from the CIA or the police. They'd eventually find out that she and Kasima Niehaus weren't the same person. Then she'd have the Canadian government after her for terrorism. That is, if her own government didn't get her first. She needed real protection. There was only one thing she could think of that both countries wanted enough to trade for her safety. The bioweapon. Sergeant Jayasara Priyantha pounded on the door. I don't care if it's 3 a.m., she thought. That corrupt SOB is going to come clean. When Art Bell finally answered, his pizza pattern pajamas made him seem anything but a corrupt SOB. He looked harmless. But Jay caught herself. Bell was her only lead left on the grit bombing slash murder case, which had been ripped away from her. If she didn't hardball him, she might lose her chance at ever getting it back. I could charge you with obstruction of justice, Jay threatened. Whoa, 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 whoa. Art stammered. You lied to me, she continued, trying to keep her voice from going shrill. She had been fighting tears all day. The government had taken away Niehaus with no explanation. It was a weird move on their part sending Greg Kurtzman, the civilian liaison officer in the Bureau of Unconventional Weapon Protocols, to do this. Why would he be given clearance to seize a terrorism suspect and possible American spy? It didn't add up. And Art Bell didn't add up either. He had piled lie after lie on her, and she could no longer discern what was going on. I didn't lie. I said 200 sisters. Art retorted. Which sounded like some crazy sorority, not the truth, she said. Would you have believed me if I cried clone? He challenged. He was right. Jay wouldn't have believed. And I did tell you Kasima wasn't a CIA operative, he added. Sure, but you stopped there. You've been holding back. Why? Art scowled. I don't know how, but you're implicated. I should just arrest you right here, Jay said, moving for her cuffs. My daughter's one of them. A clone. He blurted. Your daughter? These women are in their 30s, Jay said, skeptical. Charlotte's still a teen. Art sighed in surrender. She was a scientific miracle, the last successful clone after the initial trials, which produced the women you saw in the news. She was born in a lab and raised by CEOs of a company that dissolved. She had no family, so I adopted her. I didn't tell you because I want her out of the public eye as much as possible. The media loves tearing apart teenage girls. Think of what they do to a teenage clone. Jayasara returned his scowl. Art's paternal side was winning her over, right when she was ready to book him. I have seen these women go through hell. They fought corporations, the military. He continued. Everyone wanted a piece of them. They barely escaped. Living normal, low-profile lives was nearly impossible for these people. Now is that even an option? The world knows. Anything could happen. Not if the law is involved, Jayasara said, only half sure of her claim. Was the law able to keep Kasima in their custody? Argued Art. 
If you want to charge someone with obstructing justice, charge whoever took her, if you even can. That was exactly what Jay wanted to do, charge Greg Kurtzman, but that meant possibly charging the Canadian government. They whisked away a clone suspected of both a bombing and the murder of a geneticist. A clone who, according to Alexander Davis at the CIA, was an American spy gone rogue. Jay had gotten that tip firsthand through a personal phone call. It hadn't come through the usual channels, and now with this mind-boggling clone revelation, she was doubting this information. Actually, when she thought about the whole situation and all the players involved, she didn't know who the hell to charge for obstructing justice. You look confused. Art's words snared her. I get it. I've been there. Just want to do the right thing, whatever that is, she said. The right thing would be to step away from a case that isn't yours anymore. That's not what you really want. Art probed. I just want to find out who bombed Grit and killed Nathaniel Sturgis. And you want to climb. I know. A guy like me on the force decades ago, I did some pretty shitty things to get promoted. You're taking the high road there, pushing boundaries. I respect that. But you're biting off more than you can chew, Sergeant. Powers way above your head will block you at every turn on this thing. If you really want to break this open, get to the truth. You need to get creative. You mean break the law? It wasn't easy getting details on Katya Obinger, was it? How easy do you think it'll be to get information on an American clone operative and the government who clearly has ties to something we know nothing about? We'll find that in an old file somewhere. Doesn't mean I should give up. Jay insisted. Didn't think you would, said Art. But you need help. And I need to look out for my friend. I can be more than an informant for you. I can get hands-on. A mental image of Art getting very hands-on flashed into Jay Aceto's mind. Chalking it up to being overworked, tired, and single for too long, she crushed the image back. I've been through this before, Art went on. I can help you find the real terrorist and figure out where the corruption lies. Sergeant Priyantha considered his offer. She hated bending rules, but they'd already been bent. No, broken when Cosima was taken out of her custody. Right now, it looked like all her work would disappear into the black hole of a government cover-up. Where was the justice in that? Bending her morals a bit to serve and protect didn't seem like such a big violation in comparison. And despite what he had kept hidden, she was starting to think she could trust Art. Okay, Giaceta said. But I have nothing. They took all evidence, denied me access to the case. All I have to go on is what Niehaus said under interrogation. Nathaniel Sturgis kept the platinum close to his chest, and that I should take it to Delphine. But I don't even know what it is. She didn't think it was possible, but Art's scowl deepened. If I know costs, we need to pay Sturgis a visit, he said. He's dead, Jay replied. I know, he answered, and then unexpectedly grinned. Welcome to Clone Club. The sound of Felix Dawkins' new leather pants echoed off the morgue walls. He saw Art roll his eyes, but he didn't care. Fee relished breaking in the stiff, fresh leather. Those pants really telegraph morgue. Colin chuckled, shaking his head in embarrassment. One always wears black during a B&A. Fee retaliated, but Colin was right. Leather probably wasn't the best thing to wear while breaking in anywhere. He'd only done it because Colin used to love his ass in these pants. They'd been in a common-law rut for the last seven months, and he was trying to bring back some old magic. The pants made him feel younger. His whole caper did. He was hoping the combination of the two would remind Colin of the day they met. Nearly a decade younger, Fee had flirted with a sexy morgue attendant while he unveiled a corpse that looked identical to his sister, Sarah. This is just an E. I bypassed the B for you. Colin corrected. Since he was now the morgue manager, Colin had been able to manipulate the staff schedule to allow Art and Sergeant Priyantha to secretly inspect the body of Nathaniel Sturgis. 
Sure, Colin had been helpful, but Fee was there because he was worried about Cosima and suspicious about helping the cop who had arrested her. How dare Colin make him out to be a burden? I would have worn the assless chaps, but they weren't clean, Fee said as casually as he could. Oh, were they in that giant laundry pile? Too bad. Colin sniffed. You two better not bicker the whole time, Art complained. Next to him, Jayasara looked quite skeptical about the whole endeavor. They only had a few minutes to inspect Sturgis's pallid corpse, which was lying on a tray protruding from a refrigeration unit. Jay and Art got in close, scanning the torso. Based on Cosima's cryptic message, they assumed the platinum close to his chest was an implant or marking, but they couldn't find a scar or tattoo anywhere. Maybe he has one of those tacky underarm tattoos, Felix suggested. Colin Love, lift his arm for us, will you? Colin acquiesced, and what they saw was extraordinary. A patch of very long silver hair amongst curly black armpit locks. It wasn't bleach blonde or gray. The strands looked genuinely metallic, like platinum. God, I've been out of the club scene for a while. Is this what they're into now? It's classless. Fee cringed. Or maybe we're just getting too old for all that. Colin suggested grimly. This terrified Fee. Perhaps their rut wasn't just about laundry or familiarity or taking someone for granted. Perhaps he was too old for Colin. He suddenly felt desperate and stupid for wearing leather pants. It was exactly what someone too old would do. Art pulled a scalpel and sterile specimen container from his pocket and pushed the blade into the flesh around the patch of argent hair. Whoa, what are you doing? Jayasara shrieked. You can't tamper with evidence. Just getting creative, Art said, slicing and dicing. Can't we just take a picture? Jay asked. <laughs> Rookie, Colin snorted. Thank you, darling. Fee smiled. Took the words right out of my mouth. He caught a smile slipping across his partner's face and assumed he was making progress. We need a professional to look at this, Art said, placing a patch of wispy locks into the container. Normally, I'd take this straight to Koss, get her to analyze it, but that's not possible. Thanks to a certain sergeant, Fee piped in with malice. So what do we do? Asked Jayasara. We can't take a stolen sample to any of our labs. Oh, we've got a lab of our own, sweetheart, Felix condescended. Just follow us and try not to get in the way. As they left the morgue, Jay whispered to herself, mystified, This is weird. Just another day when it comes to clones, Art said. Like old times, even, Felix added, gazing at Colin, who cracked another smile. As they headed for Delphine's place, he caught Colin's eyes lingering on his ass. His heart fluttered. No, he wasn't too old. The magic was still there, beneath all the laundry and passive-aggressive quips. Another message lit up Kira's phone. It was 4 a.m. and her mom was still texting. But Kira was determined to keep her distance. She wasn't going to answer, not even to confirm she was safe. Kira knew if she opened the Sarah Manning floodgate, she'd drown. So she continued to scroll through news sites, reading every bit of coverage on the clones. She couldn't believe it wasn't a secret anymore. She had wanted this her whole life. And now that it was reality, she was kind of scared. Even though she was trapped and desperately had to pee, the Gene Keep storage closet felt safe. No one knew she was there. Not even the team of 22-year-old data recovery engineers working around the clock in the office to restore the nonprofit's deleted genomes. After the hack, when Gene Keep servers went back online, Kira discovered all the genomes had been wiped. Years of genetic research from the four corners of the globe vanished with the flash of a fiber optic cable. Trying to fix the situation, she requested to contact their backup service in Saskatchewan. Instead of providing her with details about the service, Dr. Bai suddenly hired a data recovery team to work day and night. It made no sense. Either Dr. Bai lied about having a backup, 
or made a deeply stupid mistake and forgot to make a copy of the priceless data. But that wasn't like him. Gene Keep was his baby. He'd do anything to preserve this company. Considering all this while trying not to pee her pants was driving Kira mental. She couldn't do it anymore. Risking it, she crawled beneath desks to the restrooms and had the most glorious pee. But the glory came to an abrupt end when she saw a pair of shoes standing in front of her stall door. <clears throat> Based on the very cheeky <clears throat> Kira knew who it was. Just a minute, she sang awkwardly. Finish up and come out so we can talk. Kira emerged from the stall to see Emmeline leaning on the sinks expectantly. Oh, hi, Em, she started. Must be wondering why I'm here. I was, like, having panic attacks in bed about the hack, so... So you left the storage closet? Em interjected. She had a your bullshitting is insulting look on her face. That's it, Kira thought. Now I have no shot with Emmeline, and I've lost this internship. I screwed myself. Should have hid my suitcase better and peed in a cup. How long have you known? Kira asked, ready to shrivel up and die. Like what weirdo loser even slept in closets for an internship? A week, Em revealed. Found your suitcase under the toner we never use, then the toiletries bag under the sink. I was going to say something, but I was hoping you'd tell me yourself. All the Harry Potter cupboard jokes make sense now. Kira groaned. Why are you sleeping in there? Asked Em. Kira couldn't tell Emmeline that she used Gene Keep software late at night to sequence and store her own genome under the name Mira Canning, and that her mother one of the now-famous clones, would practically disown her if she found out. My mom didn't want me to work here, she claimed. It wasn't a total trip to Lie Town. Sarah wouldn't want her to work there, if she knew that's what her daughter was up to. Why wouldn't your mom want you to work here? Em was baffled. Um, because I come from a long line of mistrusting people who were dominated and manipulated by corporations and crazy science nut jobs, Kira thought. She's a little backward, she said instead. But you're like, so not, Em said confused. And you're homeschooled. Kira was insulted. Hold on. I finished high school online from home, but not by choice. I was getting trolled by someone in school because I skipped a grade and was younger. I'm not proud of it, but I trolled them back and made everything worse. Let's just say it ended with the principal's chair getting smashed. But that was all my mom, not me. She hates injustice. Your mom smashed the principal's chair? Em said, weirded out. Yeah, and got me expelled. So I try to keep her involvement in my life to a minimum. It's working pretty well. I mean, yes, I'm sleeping in a closet, but I can work on stuff whenever. Kira went on to explain that she had been working late to build a more intuitive database for Gene Keep, and that one night, when everyone had gone home, she noticed specific batches of Canadian genomes being downloaded. The Nazwinag genomes, muttered M, slowly piecing it together. Yeah, Kira said. I thought the download was just some sad, old-ass way Gene Keep backed up stuff. But when I looked into it, the connection was closed, and there weren't any log files. Someone covered their tracks. Then a few days later, boom, all our data was erased. So someone stole the Nazwinag's genomes and erased all our work. Did you tell Dr. Bai about this? Of course, but he, like, fully dismissed me, said the downloads were a backup service he purchased. So why do we have recovery people here all the time if there is a backup? Exactly. Weird, Em thought out loud. We were sequencing the Nazwineg's genome when the servers went down. Score. Kira could see the mystery was sucking her in. Maybe she could get back in Em's good books, or at least the non-crazy books. A muffled, commanding voice from outside the restroom got their attention. Go! It demanded. I'm paying you, I can send you away. 
Kira and Emily glanced at each other. Dr. Bai was in the office at 4 a.m., and his voice didn't have its usual serene, new age tone. Peering out, they saw the engineers leave. As soon as the last one was out the door, Dr. Bai made a call. I'm alone, he said into the phone. Now, come down here and tell me what the hell is going on. He listened to the person on the line. Why not? When I agreed to give you access, I didn't think you'd wipe all our servers. He waited again, unsatisfied. Oh, really? Then who did it? Dr. Bai paused for a while. Whatever the answer was, he was having trouble digesting it. In our database? Why would he do it? Bai scoffed into the receiver. I don't give a shit about confidentiality. I'm going to sort this out. He hung up and charged out of the building. Bai knows who hacked us, Kira said in disbelief. Yeah, and who is he talking to? Wondered M. Whoever it was, it sounded like he gave them access to the genome database. A confidential database, Kira added. Why would he do that? Only one way to find out. My car's outside, M said, grabbing her bag. Before Kira knew it, she was in a rusted sedan shadowing a sleek black speedster, which was heading onto the freeway. Dr. Bai's leaving the city, M said. Do we follow, yes or no? They were approaching the on-ramp and had to make a decision. Yes, Kira blurted. M swerved onto the freeway, just missing the median. As they raced after Bai, Kira was worried. Chasing a boss who admired himself in some sort of shady business is not why she came to Gene Keep. And it was the exact sort of thing her mother would have a meltdown over. For a Zen guy into yoga, Bai was pretty obtuse when it came to awareness of his surroundings. He didn't notice when the girls refueled their car two pumps away from him. Later, they lost track of Bai on the road and ended up in the lane right next to him. Kira spit chocolate milk on the window in shock while Emmeline turned away her face and the car, nearly steering them into a guardrail. But Bai didn't bat an eyelash. Six hours later, he led them off the highway to a long, monotonous county road in Quebec and still didn't notice the only car behind him. Kira was starting to see how their data had been so easily hacked. After 15 hours on the road, Kira started to feel queasy. The quiet two-lane highway cut through dense forest and had spotty cell reception. Their GPS claimed they were floating in the middle of the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. It felt like the beginning of a horror movie. She was just about to wig out when the road sent them across a brand new bridge arching over a turbulent river. The pavement abruptly turned to gravel and continued into a grove of cathedral-like trees. A cluster of buildings stood in the distance behind a sign. Welcome to Nezuineg, population 144. Isn't this the place where Bai talked everyone into donating their genome to us? Kira asked as they drove in. Yeah. M confirmed. The residents weren't into it in the beginning, but Dr. Bai kept pushing. He made me design these cheery flyers to promote it with people smiling in the sunshine and stuff. Why didn't he just, like, give up? Wondered Kira. You could only get to this place by foot or boat until four years ago, when the government finally put in a bridge. Dr. Bai was practically drooling over how isolated this place was and how little gene flow it had creepy, said Kira. The girls were baffled. Both the donor of the genome that was being sequenced at the time of the hack and the hacker were apparently from this hamlet. Emmeline tried to remember the name on the sample that was in the sequencer while they lost all of their data, but couldn't. They had already driven over 15 hours and agreed that leaving without answers would be a shame. So they parked behind a bramble and went to find by. The smell of burning hardwood hung in the air as they entered a cluster of around 50 clapboard and log buildings. Apart from electric lights feeding off solar panels, it was like they had traveled back in time. Wisps of smoke rose from chimneys on cabins separated by roads only wide enough for wagons. They passed a small rounded church that Kira thought looked more like a hobbit hole, 
an ancient general store, and a post office slash museum. Formed in the 1700s by French traders fleeing the British military's violent expulsion, the settlement got the name Nazwineg, or Torn in Half, from people native to the area because it sat on a peninsula that looked like a spear cutting a river in two. The small battalion of angry exiles that fled to the area had escaped deportation and death, but not the harsh winters and influenza that stripped them of their tenacity and numbers. The few that clung to life eventually built permanent log cabins, and many of the current residents were direct descendants of those people. Holy pioneer town, Kira snickered. Holy hipster paradise, added M, pointing to a mill bearing the sign Poisson Free Microbrewery. Built on the peninsula's point, the building was flanked by two separate waterways turning mill wheels on either side. Someone was hauling a net filled with silver fish from the water, likely the poisson to be freighted for the brewery. Dr. Bai's speedster was parked outside. It stood out like an overpriced metal thumb amongst the wood buildings, hoping Bai would be just as unaware of his surroundings as he had been on the 15-hour drive. Em and Kira put on sunglasses, turned up their collars, and slinked into the brewery. Luckily for them, the place was packed with what seemed like the whole hamlet, and no one noticed their entrance. It felt more like a fighting ring than a bar, and since Kira had never really been in a bar before, she wasn't sure whether this was normal or not. The locals were crowded around a red-faced, round-bellied man whose pint sloshed as he screamed at Dr. Bai. No fucking way am I going anywhere with you, the man bellowed. I'd prefer we talk in private, Bai urged. This about your little gene library? I already gave my donation. Spit on that stick for you. Want to swab my asshole, do? He's got some snickers throughout the bar. Our lovely mayor, everyone. When democracy works, it's brilliant, no? Slurred a disgusted woman. It was clearly happy hour. Aggie, I know you voted for me, so don't play that game. Redface sneered. Like hell I did, Aggie grumbled. Sovtair, if you would. Bai continued. I would not, Sovtair bit back. Go, speak. Whatever you have to say, my people should hear it. Fine, Bai began. I want to know why you deleted our data. What do you mean? Asked Sovtair. I have it on good authority you hacked our servers and wiped all our genomes. Dr. Bai explained. I didn't touch your fucking genes, said Sauveterre. Just like you didn't touch the tires on all those trucks the government sent for bridge construction? Aggie challenged. Guess they evaporated overnight? And I guess the bridge collapsed twice from the wind? Quelle chance. We all agreed pranksters did that, claimed Sauveterre. What about the institute that accidentally released the salmon? Those were legal protests. Legal, my ass. You dumped a truckload of dead fish into their front lobby. Okay, yeah, but Grit didn't accidentally put gmo salmon in our river. Sauveterre spat, spraying like a rabid dog. That was on purpose. It was only a matter of time before they came after us for fishing them. They owned those damn things they created, and they were out eating our trout. We were going to have a river full of fish we couldn't touch. They shat in our pristine watershed. No man-made pollutants for hundreds of years. We kept it that way. My family and your family, Aggie. So now you're all about preservation. But you didn't want any of us preserving our genes, not the original families. No one. We had to fight you on this gene keep thing. People have a right to do what they want with their bodies. My people can do whatever the fuck they want. The word slid through Sauveterre's gritted teeth as he inched toward Aggie, who ignored him and sipped her drink. But my people need to understand no one gives a shit about our way of life. Not the government, not these scientists. No one. They're not your people, idiot. Aggie said under her breath. The mayor threw down his pint and rushed her. Re-emerging from the sidelines, Bai grabbed Sauveterre's collar before he reached the woman. The mayor wheeled around on Bai, slamming a fist into his face. That's it, you son of a bitch. Bai said, as blood streamed from his nose into his mouth. If I can't nail you for hacking me, I'm getting you for assault. He got out his phone and started dialing. Joke's on you, bullies don't come out this far. Sauveterre laughed, turning back to the bar. Okay, I'm thirsty again. 
When the bartender refused him a beer, Sauveter tried to take someone else's drink. Jeez, allons-y, said a sober patron as they coaxed the plastered mayor outside. Hot breath on Kira's ear nearly made her jump out of her skin. Gilles Sauveterre. Emmeline whispered to her. That was the name on the sample we were sequencing during the breach. It was his DNA. But he hates gene keep and GMO salmon and the government. Why would he give us his genome? Kira asked, confused. She wondered how Dr. Bai pressured someone like Sauveterre into a donation. What did Bai have on him? It doesn't make sense, Emmeline agreed. Considering his take on the GMO salmon, Kira could see why Gilles Sauveterre would think handing over genomes to Gene Keep was sketchy. It was strange, but she could relate to this drunken jerk of a mayor. This organism and derivative genetic material is restricted intellectual property. That was the sentence that had been written directly into the Lita genome, encoded on a marker in ASCII. The Lita clone organisms had been property of dyad, and as derivative genetic material, Kira had been too. That single sentence had created so much chaos for her mother and aunties, and that sentence had been encoded in their genome back in 1984. That was over three decades ago, Kira mused. Now they can probably fit an entire airtight contract into some junk DNA. Then a strange and possibly outlandish hypothesis about the gene keep hack sprung into her mind. She wanted to tell Emmeline about it, but didn't want to sound crazy. She needed to do research before drawing conclusions, and that involved doing something she desperately did not want to do. I need to make a phone call, she told Em. Delphine had raced down in her underwear to the front door, hoping Cosima had returned in the dead of night. When she answered, Art and Sergeant Giasera Priyantha presented her with a piece of flesh covered in long platinum locks and shorter dark hair. To say she was disappointed would be an understatement. So, what do you see? asked Giasera. Hair. Delphine tossed, not even looking up from her microscope. She was reluctant to help the woman that had arrested and then lost her wife. But apparently, Cosima wanted her to examine this weird axillary hair. Delphine hoped decoding Cos's strange message would lead her to her wife. Obviously it's hair, but what does it tell you? Jay said, impatient. It tells me this person could have had poliosis, the loss of melanin in hair, or a modification done. Delphine replied coldly. Genetic modification? Like Sturgis got this done? Asked Art. Why would he do that? Jayasara asked, bewildered. Guess you didn't party at Club Neolution in your 20s, Art said. It's like body mod. Could be a fetish or fashion statement. Under your arm? Said Jay dubiously. Were there any other patches? Delphine asked. No, Art answered. And I looked everywhere. Sturgis's crevices and folds were burned into Art's mind, unfortunately. Delphine wanted to test the sample, but she didn't want to do it with the RCMP breathing down her neck. She was thinking about how to deliver fake results to Giacera when her phone rang. Mm. It was Kira. Where are you? Delphine asked immediately. A bad way to start because all she got in return was silence. Kira, Kira, are you there? Yes, squeaked the teen finally. Pounding down the stairs, Sarah burst into the living room, stunning Jasada. Let me talk to her, she demanded. Please tell Mom I'm fine, but I don't want to talk, Kira implored. I just want to know if you can store messages in DNA, like in Auntie Cosima's, can you store other things? Uh, it's possible, Delphine said, thrown by the topic. You sure everything's okay? I can come and get you, no questions asked. I'm fine, really. So how much can you store? Like, can you store a computer virus or malware? Sure, that's just a program. You can store a book, even a movie. Convert it into binary, compress the data, and you can store about 1.8 bits per nucleotide. The complexity of what you can encode really depends on the length of the strand. Sarah ripped the phone from Delphine. 
Kira, where are you? I'm fine, Mom, okay? She shot, instantly triggered. Kira, the press release. Someone's attacking us. I need you to come home. Kira hung up. Sarah called back, only to have it go straight to voicemail. She dialed over and over, getting more frazzled with each rejected call. While Art tried to cool Sarah's burgeoning meltdown, Delphine thought about Kira's question. In Istanbul, a ring of black market geneticists made millions off implanting hair plugs encoded with banking information, corporate paperwork, and whatever other data the ultra-wealthy wanted to hide. Sturgis was just the type to indulge in something that elitist. He could have implanted these platinum hairs himself to securely store his research or other important information connected to grit, possibly the bombing. With this in mind, Delphine confronted Giacera. This hair may contain evidence that can exonerate Cosima. It may help you catch the real terrorist. Great. Can you, uh, extract the evidence? Jay asked. I can, but I'm not working for free. My priority is Cosima. I want information about her arrest. I need to know who took her. Delphine insisted, despite Jayasada's incredulous stare. Look, I'm already taking some major leaps by being here, Jay began. But I can't start revealing case details to civilians. Cosima's genes put her at risk of being exploited, possibly killed. Rules and laws mean nothing to the people that would take advantage of my wife. Jay reminded herself she was dealing with a family. She wouldn't get far with this clan unless she gave them something solid. Greg Kurtzman from the Ministry of Defense took her. Why? Delphine demanded, ready to pounce on Jayasada for answers. That's what I'm trying to figure out, Jayasada admitted. He claimed you may have leaked sensitive information to Kasima. He wanted to determine if that was true. It doesn't make sense. He didn't go right to the source of this possible leak. He didn't go to you. Feeling dizzy, Delphine sank into a chair. A member of BioThreat, one she particularly hated, took her wife and cited her as the reason. Was this just a government grab to possess a clone? Delphine was beginning to believe she may have been responsible for her wife's disappearance. No, that couldn't be completely true. Nathaniel Sturgis had a hand in it somehow. He seemed to know about the Litas, but they never got the chance to grill him on that. Though Cosima could have right before his death. Maybe that was why a small, hairy patch of Sturgis was currently sitting on a glass slide in their living room. Delphine grabbed the sample. She needed to start sequencing. So Gilles Sauveterre had a computer virus encoded into his genome. Emmeline said slowly as she recapped what Kira had just told her. And when we sequenced his genome, we launched this virus which deleted Gene Keep's data. Doesn't that sound a little sci-fi? Kira didn't think so at all. By the age of nine, she had been pushed around by a massive corporation that developed human clones, and later a crazed millionaire bent on using her Lin-28A gene to create a fountain of youth. In her world, it was totally possible that Sauveterre tainted his genetic sample with a computer virus. If anything, Kira's theory was pretty tame, but she couldn't explain this. Not without revealing she was the offspring of clones. Trust me, it's not sci-fi, Kira said. I'll prove it. She started to walk through the moonlit settlement, forcing Emmeline to follow. The wind had picked up, cooling what had been a warm autumn day. What are we doing? Em whispered. Getting proof Sauveterre is a hacker terrorist, Kira explained. How? asked Em. Shh. Kira was following her ears as she walked. She could just make out a slurred voice. It was getting louder. As they turned a corner, Kira pushed M into the shadows. They were only feet from Gilles Sauveterre, who was staggering into a cabin. Once he was inside, Kira padded over and peered through a window. The mayor was already snoring on his couch. Circling the building, she looked for a way in. She padded across the garden when... Something got crushed beneath her foot. She lifted her shoe to see a dried-out dragonfly and noticed there were a dozen more scattered around her. Weird, Kira thought. He'd protect the river but sprays pesticide all over his flowers? Shrugging it off, 
She tugged on a promising window to find it was locked. Can't break in. Emmeline insisted, but Kira was already at the front door, which swung open with a tap. She smirked at Em. There, now we don't have to break in. Happy? I'm not going. There's no way he put a virus in his genome, Em said, refusing to budge. Kira hated to pull this card, but it was the strongest argument she could come up with. 274 identical women are all over the news, yet they say no one's ever cloned a human before. 274? Last I heard, they found around 40, Em said, puzzled. That's not the point, Kira insisted. Human cloning exists, so why can't people hide malware in their DNA? Emmeline opened her mouth, but realized she couldn't argue with this. The only way to determine if there was a computer virus in Sovtel's DNA was to sequence it and see what happened. A minute later, they were standing over a snoring Gilles, watching drool roll down his cheek and trying to decide how to harvest a clean sample. Unable to find scissors, Kira grabbed a knife from the kitchen and approached the mayor. What are you doing? Em whispered, terrified. Taking a sample, said Kira. You can't slice into him. I'm not. I'm cutting some hair. But he's unconscious. It's an unsolicited donation, Em pointed out. Kira put down the knife. Emmeline was right. So they tried the bathroom for a sample. Since Jin was nearly bald, his brush was useless, but the shower drain wasn't. Using a fork, they fished out a greasy clot of tangled body hair that smelled like moldy milk skins. Only after that horrifying experience did they notice a chamber filled with beard trimmings on his electric razor. Taking the beard clippings and a couple saliva-covered beer bottles, they walked to the door. As they tiptoed past, Giz smacked his own face in his sleep, then did it five more times, paralyzing the girls with repressed laughter. But their silent giggles stopped when they realized he was covered in small splatters of blood. Inspecting him closer, Kira realized he was being bitten by mosquitoes. Weird, it's a little late in the year for them, she thought as she watched the insects. They were flying in a strange zigzag pattern, circling the mayor's head endlessly. Em, you gotta see this, said Kira, mesmerized by the bloodsuckers. No, let's just go, Em urged, getting antsy. Emerging from the cabin, Kira was thrown by what she saw. Like white moths glowing in the moonlight, chunks of snow drifted down from an inky sky. Kira, whispered Emmeline. Fear in her voice as she pointed to a strange shape by one of Gilles' windows. As Kira squinted, the shape grew in height until it was standing straight. It was a person, walking in expert silence straight toward them. Run! Kira choked. You're listening to Orphan Black, the next chapter. Starring Tatiana Maslany. Produced by Realm. Your portal to another world. Orphan Black, the next chapter, is written by Malka Older, Lindsay Smith, Madeline Ashby, Michelle Baker, E.C. Myers, and Helly Kennedy. Produced by Marco Palmieri and executive produced by Molly Barton, Julian Yap, David Fortier, Ivan Shebeg, and Carrie Appleyard. In partnership with Boat Rocker Media and BBC America. Audio produced, sound designed, and edited by Amanda Rose Smith based on the television series Orphan Black, produced by Temple Street, a division of Boat Rocker Studios. The theme music is by Two Fingers. <laughs>